uh it's a great pleasure for all of us to have thomas colas with us in the qastm forum uh this is the uh, new fresh series of the talks of qastm because it started actually in 2020 during the time of covid uh, if you guys are really interested you can go to my youtube channel and check all the previous talks uh this round this is the second talk and we uh, are very happy to have thomas with us let me give you a very short introduction to thomas thomas actually did his phd from apc paris with vasa veno and urse ias with julian grain now he is doing his postdoc from dmtp cambridge uh and he is going to talk about uh the open quantum effective field theory techniques and its application in uh, primordial cosmology mostly for inflation and uh, related aspects uh, thomas thank you for agreeing to give this talk for us and you can start well thank you very much santan and yeah, first of all uh, let me thank you for for me the opportunity to present in uh, this seminar series it's really a great pleasure to be there and yeah, I hope it will be interesting for everyone in the audience. So um, during this talk, I would like to present a set of techniques that we call open effective field theories, and especially the application in the context of primordial cosmology. And the goal of this set of techniques is to extend the effective field theories that we are using to describe the early universe in order to include dissipative and stochastic effects. So the way this presentation is organized is the following. I will first present what we call a bottom-up approach, where we don't try to specify what is the microscopic origin of dissipation and noise, but rather try to constrain their shape using symmetries and scale hierarchies. On the second part of the talk, I will present the opposite perspective on this problem, which is the top-down approach, where we start with a microphysical model, integrate out some degrees of freedom, and use that to explain the appearance of dissipation and so, so, so it's supposed I, I, to be. I, I, I have a question because, uh, sure. as far as I can remember, Leonardo Senatore with Matias Zaldariaga, they have written yes. uh, effective field theory a long time ago for dissipation. Uh, That's a very good point. Yes. Yeah, and later on the other side. This uh, Arjun Berera and companies, people have written a lot of models for warm inflation. So yes. how are you going to explain that how your scenario is uh, connected to these ideas? And uh, what are the differences or new things you are going to introduce in this formalism? You are going to explain that? Yes, absolutely. So we will discuss that. Uh, indeed, this work by Leonardo Senatore, Zaldaga, and also... Uh, Porto Lopez Nasir was very important for us because it's somehow our starting point. What we have done is to update this construction by using more recent techniques that are called non-equilibrium EFT that are used to describe dissipative fluids. So I'll explain the connection between these two work. And then I'll make some contact with warm inflation because the formalism I will describe is supposed to recover some of the phenomenology of warm inflation in some limit. So I will show explicitly at the level of the power spectrum how we recover the warm inflation results. So that's uh, included in the talk. Okay. And okay. Uh, uh, like uh, yes. another important thing I want to ask for students is that we, at present, if you just think about the non-equilibrium aspects and from that perspective, uh, open quantum systems are very much interesting. Uh, my point is, uh, from which thought you have decided to construct the open EFT setup? Mm. Okay, that's a good, uh, yes, that's a sort of, uh, we can discuss that. It's somehow the origin story of this work. So I will have several slides about uh, motivation and where does it come from. Yeah. Sure, sure. And uh, just to answer briefly about uh, the origin of this thing, it's because uh, my first research line was related to this topic known as the quantum to classical transition in the early universe, 
which is somehow to explain the emergence of classical properties in the universe, starting from quantum fluctuation. And to understand this process of quantum to classical transition, you in general need a mechanism that is called quantum decurrence. But okay. to have this mechanism of quantum decurrence, you need dissipative and stochastic effect. And this is how we started to consider this thing, at least from my perspective. But you can have very different entry points to this thing. And I hope this talk will try to present different aspects for why, why it can be interesting. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. No worries. And so, yes, the talk is supposed to be sort of two hours long. I will make sure to make a break between the two part of this talk so that everyone can rest for a bit. And yes, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions, especially if at some point it's becoming a bit too technical. The talk is also targeted for master and PhD students. Therefore, I hope it will gradually increase in complexity and that we will start from something that are quite uh, reasonable for everyone. And this is why I would like to start with a very generic introduction to the two main topics of my talk, which are pre-model cosmology and effective field theories, so that we get everyone on board. So if there is no more question for the moment, let's start with the introduction. First of all, cosmology is an observational science, which means that we construct telescopes and satellites in order to observe the sky. When we make observation of the sky, we gather images, such as this beautiful one from the JWST telescope, where you can see that there are a very wide variety of objects that appear in this image. You can see gas in the foreground, stars a bit further away, and galaxies in the background. So once you get these images from the sky, you need some treatment because you cannot do physics directly with this kind of images. You need to construct catalogs of objects that are similar because if the objects are similar, it is likely that they obey the same physical laws and physical dynamics. For instance, this map on the left is a map of the galaxy structure that surrounds us, that we call the large scale structure of the universe. They are given in terms of the redshift that is pretty much the distance from us. On the right hand side, you have another type of signal that is very useful for cosmologists, which is known as the cosmic microwave background. It's a radio signal that was emitted 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And that constitutes one of the main relics to which we look at to have an idea of what was the physics at play in the very early universe. So we started with observation. We constructed catalogs of objects that are similar. And now we can start to do physics with them. That is, we can start to ask the question, how is the information organized into these images? In general, we do this for the mean of what we call summary statistics. That is, we will compute the mean, the variance, the skewness, the courtesies, and so on. And in this way, we will characterize the information that is contained in these catalogs. For instance, that led to these two images, the left for the galaxy formation, the right for the cosmic microwave background. And these two images are like the power spectrum, or if you want the variance as a function of scale, of the distribution of galaxy and of the temperature and isotropies of the cosmic microwave background. The data points are the one with error bars. And as you can see, the signal is far from being featureless. For instance, when you look at the galaxy power spectrum, you observe a sort of peak at around 100 megaparsec. And when you look at the cosmic microwave background, you observe this beautiful oscillation that are called the baryonic acoustic oscillation. So, since a signal has some feature, we can start to introduce theoretical model to explain the origin of this feature. And this is where theory and observation make contact. So, so far, I, the approach that has been... Yeah? I have a question. Um, uh, like the multiple plot you were showing for the large L, uh, for the large yes. multiples like uh, beyond 30, it's very accurate. But in between two to thirty, ah, yeah, sorry, large, yes, yeah, between two to thirty, it is highly erroneous. The error bar, yes, the low high. multiple, yeah. So yeah. low multiple thing. Uh, can you do as a theoretician? Do you have any suggestion, uh, uh for students and uh, other people, what to look for for the low L? What what is the uh, anomaly and what is the problem in the low L physics in CF? 
Yes, uh, so that's a sort of a specific question to give a bit of context for the students. Low L means very large scale of the universe. And since we only observe one universe, we have very low statistics on very large scale because we can do only one measurement. And this is why the error bars are very huge on the low multiple. And as you can see, it's true that there is a sort of discrepancy between the theoretical model that we now present, which is this plain line, and the observation with zero bars, with this sort of dip here that has led to a lot of discussion. And it's a topic that is a bit hard. We need to understand if this thing comes from pure statistical effect, like um, just a statistical error, or if it can be imputable to some new physics. And I think it's very hard to tell at the moment, at least from what I understood from discussion with people that work more on the observational side of the CMB data analysis. They are not really sure that we could argue this mismatch is really coming from new physics. This is why at the moment I would be tempted to be very cautious about the interpretation of this uh, like low multiple. And this is why I won't suggest any direction for new physics for this problem. But it remains an open question, and some people have been very successful in finding eventual physical explanation for this origin. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't want to discourage people to look at it. It's just that myself, I haven't considered this problem so far. I hope it answers the question. Okay. Yes. If, yes. Okay. 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 So. Let me introduce the model that has been the most successful to, so far to explain this data. This model is based on two pillars, which are general relativity and a set of symmetries that we call the, the cosmological principle. General relativity is telling you that the universe evolves according to its content, whereas the set of symmetries is telling you that around you there is no preferred direction nor observer, which is homogeneity and isotropy. So based on this principle, you can now make some guess about what is the matter content of the universe and derive theoretical expectation that will be the plane curve. And then by comparing the data to the theoretical expectation, this is how you obtain fit for what we call the cosmological parameters that are the three parameters of this model. And that leads to the so-called lambda CDM model or the standard model of cosmology. It's so far the most successful attempt to fit all the observations we have at our disposal. And this model is a conjunction of a universe content and a cosmic history. So if we have a look to the universe content, what is fascinating about it is that only a few percent represent the matter that we are used to around us, such as star, helium and hydrogen, heavy elements and neutrinos. The rest of the universe content today is mostly made of dark matter and dark energy for which we start to have a good effective understanding, but still lack a microphysical understanding of their origin. On the cosmic history side, the universe is about, in this approach, 13.8 billion years old. And um, it evolved from the Big Bang, the initial singularity, up to now. During this talk, the era that will particularly interest us is the era called inflation, which is pretty much the first second after the Big Bang which role is to seed the initial condition for the subsequent evolution of the universe. And in my opinion, one of the most fascinating aspects of inflation is to relay the appearance of structures in our universe, such as galaxies, clusters, voids, and filaments, to quantum fluctuations of the primordial vacuum. So it makes that inflation is an interesting playground to test the conjunction between quantum mechanics and general relativity. There are a few aspects about inflation that are very well-tested features that seem consistent with all the observations that we have so far at our disposal, such as the fact that all the observations are consistent with the existence of an early phase of accelerated expansion, with which the universe expanded by a huge amount in a very short period of time, and also consistent with the idea that all the structure formation that we later on observe in the universe can originate from quantum fluctuations of the primordial vacuum. So there exists alternative model, but these features are well tested and compatible with all observation. At the same time, there are many open questions that we haven't answered so far for inflation. 
And for instance, the one of the precise energy scale of inflation is still under debate. You can characterize this quantity by the value of this Hubble parameter, which characterizes the expansion of the universe during inflation. And this quantity could be as high as 10 to the power 13 GeV, where this bond is coming from the lack of detection of tensor mode so far in the data. So as you can see, inflation could eventually happen at energy scales that are far above what we probe on Earth by our largest colliders, where typically it's the order of the TeV scale. And this is why inflation can be an interesting playground to test new physics beyond the standard model of particle physics so, and eventually, yes, please. I, I have a question. So uh, if the scale of inflation is very high, so there is no problem, but if the scale is very low, there is a lots of other problem from the particle physics side. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and like low scale inflation has a main problem. If you set the scale very low, then you have to very be very careful about the uh, symmetry breaking scale of SU2 cross U1. Electric yes, yes. Symmetry breaking. Now, uh, a lot of people means I have seen the literature that some people used to uh, set the scale at the electroweak symmetry breaking. You, do you have any comment on that? Uh, if the scale is uh, low, then what happens? Yeah, I'm not an expert on this topic, especially. And just from what I read on the literature, I think I won't try to put the energy scale of inflation too low because I would be afraid to mess with what happened after the end of inflation. Uh, but to be honest, uh, like I never tried to do it in practice in a specific model. So I don't know explicitly uh, what to expect from it. But I think it raises a fair point is that um, because why during I'm inflation... Asking, are, yeah, why sorry. I'm asking this question in a particular reason, like uh, once we construct, uh, so it, it probably we'll discuss it. So there are two approaches of EFT. One is the top down and another one is the bottom up. In both the approaches, you basically talked about the heavy fields and the light fields. So you basically integrate out, path integrate out the heavy fields and write down an effective field theory of the uh, means lower mass contents, uh, which you use as an inflaton or something like that in this effective yes. construction. Uh, maybe this is a Wilsonian point of view or something like that. But my question is, uh, there, once we, one, one, once we integrate out all these heavy degrees of freedom, we, during this uh, path integration or performing this thing, we assume that the scale is very high. So like, mm. I, I'm a bit confused what people do for the low low scale inflation means they run the theory in the low scale means they do some kind of RG to the low scales or something like that. I really don't know means I'm asking you. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know neither. I don't know neither because in the kind of approaches we develop very often, what we try to characterize is the dynamics of the fluctuation. So it means that in this kind of approach, we consider the background as fixed and in a sense, we consider the energy scale or the energy density during inflation fixed by the background evolution of the inflaton field. So um, this is a problem that we never really consider in the kind of approaches I will present today. But that's a good question how to embed it in a more complete picture where you also try to understand the background dynamic and especially what happens if this background dynamics is pointing to a low scale inflation. That it's an open question. But I think it's particular toward this fact that um, inflation is interesting because at the same time, there are tight constraints from observation. And at the same time, there are many open questions that are still unanswered. This is why I think it's a good playground for people that want to start to work on cosmology, especially given the fact that, as I was trying to highlight here in this slide, there will be a lot of new data coming in the future that will hopefully help us to even tightly constrain what is happening during inflation. So hopefully this idea of at the same time tightening our theoretical expectation and tightening our 
uh, observational bound will allow us to have a more precise picture of what's going on during inflation. And as you raise, there are many open questions. So that was it for the general introduction to primordial cosmology and especially inflation. And as I told you, in the future, we will have more data. But the point is that in order to extract information for the data, we not only need new information, we also need new tools to analyze it, to extract the information from the data. And this is precisely what effective field theories are particularly useful for. So let me know, present a bit this second player of my story. If you want, in physics, very often we need to understand how we lose information about the microphysical details of a theory when we zoom out and look at the coarse grain or hydrodynamical version. Because very often we want to formulate a theory at its most fundamental level gives the microphysical constituents, the fundamental law of nature. But when we set up an experiment, what we really see are very macroscopic views of the problem, the long wavelength physics that we call the IR physics in a sense. This is exemplified in the example of water where we somehow desire at the microphysical level to understand molecules and their interaction. Whereas when we go near the shore, we just see ocean waste and we need to make sense of it. And so in this journey from very short scale to very large scale, we very often lose information. So we need to understand how is organized this dialogue from zooming in to zooming out. In particular, we need to understand what are the relevant degrees of freedom in the long wavelength description. Can we exploit any symmetries or scale hierarchies to simplify the description? Is the outcome of this procedure unitary or not, local or not? This is the kind of question we aim at understanding with effective field theories. And on the way back from the long wavelength physics, where we do our experiment to the fundamental laws of nature, we need to understand how we can retrieve information and how do we deal with uncertainty or unknown about the microphysical description? Because in many situations, we don't know what is the precise microphysical description. That can be the case when we consider a very high energy physics situation where we have some uncertainty, for instance, about quantum gravity. But in a simpler situation, that can be simply the fact that we don't understand, for instance, the galactic formation process. And since we don't understand this thing to describe the evolution of the dark matter fluids, we need to include some uncertainty about galactic physics. So effective field theories are the modern tool we use to organize this dialogue between UV and IR. And during this talk, what will particularly interest us is question related to what we call the unitarity of the IR description. It's this question of, is the information remaining self-contained within the long wavelength regime, or does it happen that we have sort of cascade where we lose information from the very long wavelength to the very short wavelength? That will be the main topic of this talk. And let me explain a bit better why it is the case. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So my question is, uh, Recently, there are lots of approaches people are talking about, like uh, cosmological bootstrap. Yes. Yeah. There, people try to construct correlators uh, from symmetries. They People are not interested in what exactly going on inside the theories. They try to utilize the symmetries. Maybe the symmetry is broken a very small amount and people are say, saying that this breaking is basically the slow roll. Uh, similar kind of idea people are already talked before from conformal field theories. Conformal yes. field theory people usually say that if the conformal symmetry is slightly broken, then you can actually construct all these cosmological correlators. Uh, bootstrap people thinking about this problem from the perspective of scattering amplitudes. Uh, so are you thinking that all these constructions are basically based on the uh, development of effective field theory? Well, I guess it depends to who you talk, but uh, in my opinion, there are many connections at least between effective field theory approaches and bootstrap techniques in the sense that, as you said, bootstrap techniques are testing fundamental principles. They try to understand what is the impact of symmetries 
unitarity, locality, and the structure of cosmological correlators. Hmm. Okay, so in the sense they won't try to write down an explicit Lagrangian, they will try to understand how tightly constrained are the correlators just from the principle I edicted here. Okay, for instance, the existence of a Goldstone boson, you will have a massless degree of freedom that will imply some structure on your correlators. If you impose conformal symmetry, you will even more, you will have a nearly scale invariant power spectrum. So you see, in the sense that I think Bootstrap is going even maybe one step further than EFTs in the sense that they try to give up on writing down an effective Lagrangian. But somehow the idea is the same because what we want to test in the end are fundamental principles rather than specific theories. And for this reason, I think they share a lot of so Thomas, Common you were yes. right. What you were saying, I have asked this question specifically for one reason. Uh, as far as effective field theory is concerned, I don't have any problem. But once you are thinking about open effective field theory, in case of open effective field theory, writing down the unitary scattering amplitudes is very difficult. I don't know how to write it. Okay. Uh, means somebody asked me, can you write a, a Schwinger Dyson series and scattering amplitudes, unitary scattering amplitudes for the open EFT? I really don't know how to write. So for open EFT, such bootstrap technique will work? Do you think so? Or maybe people should think about this sort of problem very seriously for the future. No, I think it's an excellent question, and I would like to come back to it by the end of the presentation, because I think it's one of the greatest challenges we currently have as theoretical cosmologists, is this observation that some of the techniques we are using in particle physics are very hard to extend to cosmology, especially the uh, so-called S-matrix bootstrap is very hard to embed in cosmology, precisely for the reason that you stated, which is because of the lack of energy conservation, it's hard to define uh, well-defined scattering amplitudes. Yes. And a lot of people are working on overcoming these issues. In my opinion, the development of open EFTs is a way to provide a, an angle to this problem. That is, let's pinpoint one of the problems that we have to generalize, for instance, bootstrap techniques to cosmology, and then let's try to understand this point and to see how we can overcome it. So I, I agree with you. I think it's one of the greatest challenge. It's not complete yet. It's hard, but I think if we work hard on this thing, we will be rewarded. I think we will learn something about cosmology. And hopefully there will be ways to overcome this limitation. For instance, by the end of my talk, I will present a few research direction about entropy bonds. So there are somehow attempts to use other quantities than the S matrix, for instance, the entanglement entropy, to place bonds on the parameters of your EFT. And these are ways to use objects that are well-defined in cosmology to extend positivity bonds to cosmology. So that's future work. Thank you. Thanks for the question. It was a good, interesting point. OK, but first, let me try to motivate a bit why sometimes we need to go beyond writing an action that is local and unitary, as we often do. Like, for instance, in particle physics, very often we try to write down the most general effective action, which is local and unitary, and that will be the end of the journey. But I would like to argue that there are fields in physics where it's not enough to follow this approach. And the simplest example for this is hydrodynamics. As you know, we can use a perfect fit description to describe, for instance, the occurrence of ocean waves in the deep water regime. In that case, you can find the Wilsonian effective approach to describe this problem. Energy will be conserved, and you will have a very compelling description to explain the occurrence of ocean waves in the deep water regime. But we know that in nature, fluids are not perfect. They also have some form of viscosity that can lead to turbulence and dissipation cascades. And so there are some situations where it's not enough to use this perfect lead description. In that case, we need to use, instead of the earlier equation, the so-called Navier-Stokes equation, and we need to go beyond the perfect fit description. So the Wilsonian effective field theory approach breaks down, and we need more generic construction, such as the one that was developed 
in the last 10 years by Liu and Gorioso mostly, that is known as the non-equilibrium effective heat theory. And the key point or the key difference between this situation and this situation is the fact that energy is not conserved in the case where we need to account for viscosity. So viscosity is sort of the avatar of dissipative effect. It's telling you that your EFT is not retaining energy in or information. And accounting for this fact might be crucial. So we would like to understand if in cosmology, we need to account for this dissipative effect. And answering this question is full generality is very hard. Very much depends on the kind of observable we are considering and on the physical situation under scrutiny. But let me give you a few broad heuristic arguments to explain why this kind of dissipative effects are most likely to happen in cosmology than, for instance, in particle physics. First of all, in cosmology, Thomas? the scales are dynamical. Yes? Yeah. So uh, it's a very nice that you have pointed this. So I just can remember one thing. In statistical mechanics, uh, people used to talk about a system where these non-equilibrium effects uh, are very important. Uh, people used to consider it's a one-dimensional effect. It's called Kardar Pairisi Zhang model, KPZ yes. model. Yeah. Yes. Uh, have you heard about this? Yes, a little bit. Uh, in fact, many of the techniques that uh, we are trying to implement on cosmology comes from the field of uh, condensed matter and uh, like open quantum system, where people are considering what we call very far from equilibrium systems. Yeah. And I think the one you talk about is precisely one of the well-studied examples. Maybe because it's... Uh, okay, maybe I'm saying something stupid, but I'm wondering if this 1D example is not uh, integrable, like uh, exactly solvable. I, I can't yeah, remember might, now. It, it might not be exactly solvable, yes. Okay, okay, okay. But in any case, it's a well-studied uh, problem for this kind of path for equilibrium system. And many of the techniques that I will present today come from this field that yeah. aims at understanding probably, what is the dynamics. Prob very pro probably you know this technique. It's called Harvard's, uh, Harvard's Taternoboy Bridge. Yes, yes, yes. We use it a lot to yeah. go from the path integral representation that we call the yeah. inference functional to the Langevin equation, which is the stochastic differential equation that describes the equation of motion. I will present that later on. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Okay. Okay, but first let me argue a little bit why we might need to include dissipative effects in cosmology. First of all, in cosmology, the scales are dynamical, which means that we necessarily have some form of UV IR mixing simply from the fact that due to the expansion of the universe, there is always an inflow of UV modes in the IR. The second aspect that is important for cosmology is the lack of stationarity. Due to the expansion of the background, we always are somehow kicked out of equilibrium. And this is why very, in many situations in cosmology, at least in the context of primordial cosmology, we need to consider non-equilibrium system that do not fulfill the fluctuation dissipation relation. And in particular, the vacuum does not stay empty because it gets populated by a lot of particle creation. So out of equilibrium system has an important component for cosmologists. And at last, the third aspect is that probably it's the most important one due to the lack of time translation symmetry in cosmology. We don't have any notion of energy conservation. And in particular, we do not expect the occurrence of well-segregated energy sector, one for the UV and one for the IR. So for all of these reasons, it's much more likely to observe dissipative effects in cosmology than in particle physics. And in fact, we already know many situations in cosmology where we need to account for these dissipative effects. This is, for example, the, the case for reheating, for Big Bang nucleosynthesis, or for the so-called effective heat theory of the large-scale structure, when one of the crucial aspects is the inclusion of viscosity and noise to describe the dark matter component. So, now that we have accounted for the fact that we might need to include dissipative and non-unitary effects, we want to extend the effective theory that we are using in cosmology to include these effects. And the approach we propose to follow is based on a set of techniques that we know as open quantum systems. 
So open quantum system have a long lasted history. They started in the 19th century with the study of Lord Brown of pollen molecules immersed into water. In particular, the erratic movement of pollen molecules immersed into water. And that has culminated in the beginning of the 20th century with the discovery of atoms, thanks to the pioneer work of Einstein and through the experimental uh, um, approach of Perra. So in this open system approach, the idea is that we have an unknown environment that we don't precisely know. So we will encode the uncertainty about this environment through a set of stochastic variables that we call noises. And this is what is useful to describe what we call the Brownian motion. That is, when we look at this pollen molecule in water, we will observe it as this erratic trajectory. We can describe this trajectory in terms of a Langevin equation. That is a stochastic differential equation where the noise will play the role of the stochastic kicks that make the erratic trajectory. If we sample for a lot of these trajectories, we can derive a probability distribution that describes how lucky you are to be at a given position at a given time. And the dynamics of this probability distribution is what we call the Fokker-Planck equation. And at last, in 1923, Wiener realized that we can have a path integral representation for this probability distribution function. And this is what we know in the, the modern language as the Martin Seagal and Rose formalism from Brunan motion. So all these techniques work together. For instance, uh, as you say, and then I can do the Bar Stratanovich transform to go from the path integral to the Langevin equation. And the thing I would like to stress is that all this classical dictionary has its quantum analog, where the Langevin equation is replaced by a stochastic Schrodinger equation the Fokker-Planck equation by what we call the master equation, and the MSR path integral by the inference function. So that will constitute a... Yes, one, please. One thing I just want to uh, ask, uh, once we are thinking about this open systems, uh, environment plays a significant role. Means the, there is a constant dissipation happening with the environment or some in energy interaction mass transfer, something, something is happening. So this information is basically in, encoded in lean blood here. Yes. Yeah. So my question is, once you are uh, writing the effective theory, uh, in terms of the system degrees of freedom, isn't it dependent on the environment, though you are path integrating out the environment, but is it completely model independent or some sorts of information of the environment is encoded in the system? So I am a bit uh, confused. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you are right. So there, there are two approaches. The first one is you go top down. You take a model, integrate out the environment, and mm -hmm. then the statistical property of the environment and the way it is coupled to the system will tell you what is the Limbladian. So you can explicitly write down what is the Limbladian. And in this case, as you said, it depends on the properties of the environment. For instance, uh, I don't know, its mass, its dynamics, and so on. So yeah. that's the first point. But the top-down approach is complementary to this. It tells you, I don't know what is the environment, Okay. I just know that the Limbladian depends on its properties. But these properties cannot be whatever I want because these properties are constrained by the symmetries, the scale hierarchies, and so on. Okay. And so even if I don't know what is the detail of this environment, it starts to fulfill a certain set of rules. And these rules will constrain what is the type of Limbladian I might allow to write on. But it, yeah, that's the that's the idea. So problem. according to you here, particularly, which uh, technique, the top-down approach or bottom-up approach, which one is more useful? So I really believe, but it, I think it's more general than just open quantum system. I, I really believe that there is a complementary between model building and uh, bottom-up effective approaches in the sense that uh, model building are important to exhibit phenomena that we want to model or that we want to observe in the data. So we need some top-down approaches to have hints of what we should look for. And then bottom-up approaches are useful because they need to capture these effects that we want to observe 
and to provide a sort of generalization to many different models of this situation. So I really believe that there is a sort of synergy between these two things and that we should not oppose them. It rather depends on what you want to do. Okay. So for instance, if you want to understand a specific model, well, you need to go top down. If you want to understand the general structure of this uh, Lindbladian, then I would advise to go bottom up. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, so that's the set of techniques we will use. And now let me give what a sort of roadmap of what we want to do. The idea is that we want to use the set of techniques, the open effective field theory techniques, to describe this kind of situation in cosmology, where what I will call the system is made of the degrees of freedom we really observe today in our current experiments. And in fact, in the context of primordial cosmology, it is in general captured by a single scalar degree of freedom that we call the curvature of perturbation on very large scale of the order of thousand of megaparsec or hundred of megaparsec. That are what we observe when we look at the cosmic microwave background temperature and isotopies or the galaxy structure of the universe. And we want to understand the impact of all other constituents that may have existed in the early universe, but that we haven't observed so far on this degree of freedom using this open EFT technique. So what I will call the environment will be, for instance, high energy extension or multifield construction or simply the impact of the very short scale of the very large ones through the nonlinearities of GR. And the motivation for using e open EFT techniques to describe this kind of situation is the following. First, there is a phenomenological motivation because it happens in some cases that there is a degeneracy between unitary effects that have been already studied through the usual EFT techniques and non-unitary effects that I will today present. For instance, a small speed of sound in the EFT of inflation can be also mimicked by your large dissipation in the open effective field theory of inflation. And if we don't, if we are not aware of this type of degeneracy, it means that there is a risk that we will misinterpret the data. That is, if we do not provide enough theoretical template to analyze the data, then we need to we risk to miss the physics. That's the first motivation. The second motivation is, let's say, more conceptual. It's related to this idea that open effective field theory may help us to understand a few conceptual questions related to inflation. For instance, this question that I mentioned briefly in the introduction about the so-called quantum to classical transition of the early universe. Or how do we explain the fact that the statistics we observe in the sky seem so far very much classical despite its quantum fluctuation origin? And the last question that can be answered by this kind of open EFT techniques is a sort of technical question related to the fact that there are many computations that lead to a breakdown of perturbative techniques in cosmology, to in particular to either IR divergences or what we call secular divergences that are like correction that grows with time. And that means that we need techniques that somehow allow us to go beyond standard perturbation theory. And hopefully, open effective field theory might help us to perform what we call resummations in a way that is somehow similar to what is already used in the context of stochastic inflation. So these are mostly the three main motivations for using open effective field theory for primordial cosmology, phenomenological, conceptual, and technical. And that being said, we are done with the generic introduction about the two main ideas of my talk, primordial cosmology and effective field theories. And now I can take a few questions, maybe from students if there are any, before jumping into the first approach I would like to develop in this talk. Are there any questions? If there is any question, please ask. If not, then we will ask it at the end of the talk. Sure, sure. Okay, so then let me present the first approach, which is what we call a bottom-up approach. So I will explain uh, where this project comes from and how it connects with um, the previous work in the field that will come back to one of the first questions of this talk. Then I will explicit what is the construction and how it works in practice. And at last, I will describe a bit the phenomenology we expect from this class of work. 
And so first, let's talk about the origins. The idea is that the first reason why we started to work on this thing is the formalism that we use in pre-model cosmology to compute expectation value of observables, which are really the thing that we look at when we make an experiment, when we compare the data to the theory, the way we make contact is by computing expectation value of observables, such as this quantity. And the formalism that we use on the theoretical side to use it is the so-called in-informalism. So let me present this formalism. It really much works how you compute expectation value in standard textbook quantum mechanics, the one you learn when you are an undergrad student. The idea is that you consider some observable, quantum mechanical observable, such as an endpoint function, and then you specify a theory, which is you specify an object that is called the evolution operator that tells you how you move from the initial state at the beginning of inflation to the final state at the end of inflation. So for convenience in this talk, I will very often consider that the initial state is a so-called bunch Davis vacuum state. But if you need, you can eventually relax this assumption. And what is important is that this evolution operator capture the theory of your problem in the sense that if I express the evolution operator in the field basis, it is given in terms of a path integral representation that contains my action. So when I specify the evolution operator, I specify the field content of the theory. The situation that is very often considered in cosmology is the one where we know all the degrees of freedom. For instance, the theory so, will be only discrete. Yes. So this is your Lorentzian partition function, actually. Yes, yes, Lorentzian, yes, Lorentzian signature. Yeah. And uh, so I will first describe the situation that people usually consider, which is the one where we know all the degrees of freedom. And very often in the context of primordial cosmology, people focus on a single scalar adiabatic degree of freedom that we call the curvature perturbation. In that case, when I compute this expectation value, I put a bra on the left, a cat on the right. I can use some representation of the identity. And so I will have this formula where I have two evolution operators that appear, one on the left from the bra and one on the right from the cat. Okay. So if I use the path integral... I yes. have one more question. <laughs> Sorry, sure. I'm asking so many questions. Please don't mind. No, no, it's good. It's good. No, no, it's good. So usually if it is in a Lorentzian signature, calculating the saddles are very difficult. Uh, it might be there are uh, theories people have looked for. One of them is Pikard lipschitz theory. Okay. Using that, people used to construct the saddles. So many people do it like in a different way, which is like uh, converting it into uh, the Euclidean signature and finding out this uh, saddles and then go back to the previous. So uh, what exact uh, thing you have followed here? You uh, have done completely in Lorentzian signature or you have Euclidean? Yes, signature? yes. Yeah, okay, okay. No, in, a, in our case, like um, we follow this sort of standard approach used by most cosmologists that work on quantum field theory in curve space time, that is perturbative QFT, which mm. is staying in Lorentzian signature and just implementing this small shift in the path integral contour that we call the I epsilon prescription that True. allows to guarantee that at initial time you are in the bunch Davis vacuum. But we haven't tried to do this kind of uh, rotation to a Clidean, which sometimes in cosmology can be a bit tricky because when you do the change of the path integral contour, you can eat either a singularity or a branch cut that will trigger particle creation. So this is why sometimes in cosmology, doing this kind of manipulation can be a bit dangerous. Okay. But yes, I agree, you can play this game to do, for instance, in kind of mapping between... Um, ADS to DS correlators and stuff like this. That, that can work. Yeah, but yeah. we haven't followed this route at all. That, that's why I have but, asked this. Yeah. But in the future, it might be um, it might be a research line to better understand how we can modify our path integral contour to be smarter about the way it is performed. That can be a, a, an interesting research line. For instance, this paper I have mentioned here, the goal of this paper was to explain how 
to manipulate this in-in contour in the case where we know all the degrees of freedom to transform it in an in-out contour, which is the kind of contour that is used in particle physics. Yeah, And so yeah. in the case where there is, where the theory is fully unitary and there is no non-unitary effect, you can do this kind of manipulation Is, is to this map the paper? in-in contour to in Is this the paper where in in is equivalent to in out? Yes, that's precisely the paper. Okay, okay. I I am aware of this paper. Okay, okay. Because um, my point is to say that when you know all the degrees of freedom, you have a unitary operator on the left, a unitary operator on the right. And if I insert the path integral representation, it will take this form where, no, in my path integral, I have two contours. One that goes forward in time, associated with this evolution operator, and one that goes backward in time, associated with this evolution operator. And you can see that the action splits. One action goes through the plus branch, one action goes through the minus branch. And this is what we call the in-informalism, in the sense that in that approach, we only specify the initial state, in my case, the Penchevis vacuum, and then we forward evolve the theory up to the end of inflation, then backward evolve up to initial time again. And so the interest of this approach is twofold. First, you only have to specify the initial state. That means that you can study what we call the transient dynamics, where you are very far from equilibrium because you don't specify what is the final state. And this is different, for instance, from what is the, done in particle physics when we do sort of in-out computation where we specify both the initial state and the final state. And the second thing this formalism is good at is to deal with situations where some of the degrees of freedom are unknown, and we call the environment. So let's consider the situation where no, my action contains a part that I observe that I call the system, and a part that I don't observe that I call the environment, which is a hidden sector. The two can interact, and the goal is to understand on a general footing what is the impact of this hidden sector on the system. And in fact, the impact will be captured by an object that we call the influence function. That is, when we compute this expectation value, it has a part that looks just as before. So you have the two branches of the path integral, the two microphysical action of the system. But now you have this contribution that is called the influence functional and that captures the effect of this hidden sector onto my system. And if I want to describe the effect of this influence functional, it has mostly three physical effects. The first one is that it changes the action that propagates on each branch of the path. So that is, it generates an effective action, which is the same on each branch of the path integral. And this is a unitary effect. This is typically what you expect from standard Wilsonian effective field theory. But the influence functional also generates two other effects that are so-called dissipation and noise, and that cannot be captured if you do not have this picture in the so-called Schwinger Kaldish or in in contour. These non-unitary effects, they correspond to the mixing between the two branches of the path integral. And physically, they capture the loss of energy of in or information or the gain of the system with its environment. So in condensed so, system, we also do the same thing. Yes, yes, it works exactly the same. Like these techniques, uh, so in fact, it, it was in the PhD thesis of Feynman that it was mm, first mm, developed. I know, I know. But so, so, so it has been used in the context of particle physics, but the modern avatar of this approach is mostly used in condensed matter because very often in condensed matter, you cannot guarantee that some degree of freedom won't mix with the other one that you do not observe. And in fact, when you do an experiment, for instance, in the context of quantum optics, you in general expect some loss. For instance, you have a quantum optics cavity, cavity with photons inside. You in general expect some loss of the photons that are inside the cavity into the surrounding, into the environment. And so you need this kind of uh, influence functional modeling to understand this kind of loss. So this is very much used in condensed matter, yes. And so, so my point is the following. So the, ah, yeah, I think the work you have pointed, it's by Feynman and Vernon. Yes, the origin of this thing, as far as I know, is uh, this so-called Feynman-Vernon influence functional. I think it's the oldest paper on this thing that is from 1956. 
and later i think caldera legate yes so caldera legate is an explicit model that is exactly solvable yeah. uh, for which uh, you can uh, it's a sort of microphysical model to explain brownian motion and it's particularly convenient to describe this problem in terms of the influence function it's probably yes, yes. one of the easiest way to describe it so my point is the following when you have a particle physics background, in general, you know how to construct this sort of effective field theory based on symmetries and scale hierarchy. But the point is that we don't really know how to construct in a generic footing this sort of mixing in the path integral. So this is the origin of our work. What are the rules that are obeyed by this object in terms of symmetries, scale hierarchies? That was the first motivation. The second motivation is the so-called effective field theory of inflation. So it's an approach that is used in primordial cosmology to describe a very wide variety of microphysical models that we call single clock model of inflation in a single description. And I will review this construction very briefly and try to explain how we can be tempted to extend it to capture more effects. So the idea is the following. Let's consider a universe that is evolving in a background that is mostly homogeneous and isotropic that we call a friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric. And we expand the metric and the scalar field in background value plus fluctuation. So for instance, the scalar field has a background that is homogeneous and isotropic and some fluctuation. Since it's a GR computation, we can choose the gauge. And the gauge we will work in is the so-called unitary gauge. Be careful, it has nothing to do with unitarity of the description. It's just a historical name, if you want. And so in this gauge, we consider a scalar field that is homogeneous, that are all the fluctuations are captured by the metric. The scalar field is really homogeneous. And if it is homogeneous, we can use this scalar field to describe the clock of the system. That is, we can define a foliation of time in terms of the background value of the scalar field. That's nice because now we have a geometric description of the evolution. We can describe unit vectors that are perpendicular to these spaced slices. And then we can construct other geometric objects based on this foliation. For instance, the induced metric, the extrinsic curvature, and so on. Okay, so we have a parametrization. Now the question is, how do we capture the physics of inflation? Like, what should we do to describe the situation where we have a nearly exponentially expanding universe? And the important physical insight of this paper is the following. The physics, the crucial part about inflation is to have a scalar field that has a vacuum expectation value. And since it has a vacuum expectation value, it is necessarily breaking time translation symmetry. So the idea was, Let's try to write down the most generic action that is not invariant under the full diffeomorphism invariance, but only under 3D spatial diffeomorphism. And it turns out that doing this job is a way to very effectively capture the phenomenology of this single clock model of inflation. It means that in this construction, you are allowed to write down 4D covariant terms, such as the Ricci scalar, that are a fortiori 3D spatial covariant. But you are now also allowed to write like time dependent functions of time or objects that depend on this geometric construction that we have done, such as contraction with this orthogonal vector. And the idea is that this object won't transform very nicely under time reparametrization, but still they will have the nice property under 3D spatial diffeomorphism. And then we write down the most generic action that we can construct based on this ingredient. So I've written here uh, the historical form of this action. I think it's not the most generic one. Some people may me this remark. So but what is important Thomas, about this? Don't yes. mind. I just want to make a point. So it's, yes. it's just nothing but this formalism is basically the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Yes, yes. It's understanding single clock inflation as a spontaneous symmetry breaking pattern of time translation symmetry. Indeed. Yes. Exactly same. Means like what we do in for SUN gauge theories, it's similar like that. Yes, it's a similar approach, exactly. 
So one could argue how sure are we that we have this sort of symmetry breaking pattern, but I think it's more taking the problem the other way around. It's saying, let's assume we have a symmetry breaking pattern of time transition symmetry and look at what are the observational consequences. And when we look at the observational consequences, we observe that is very much compatible with the data. So I think what is pointing toward is that the data are very much compatible with this sort of time transition symmetry breaking pattern. That is the it, it, it's way a, I would. It's just a surprising fact, isn't it? Don't you think so? I mean, surprisingly, theory of whole stone bosons are basically uh, replicating the curvature perturbations and trying to match with all the observations correctly. Isn't it very, uh, means, uh, I, I found this is very miraculous. It's it's really yes exciting. yes yes yeah yes yes it's uh I I found it also very beautiful. The question is is it um so surprising? And I think that's a matter of debate. The only thing I would like to argue is that we know that primordial cosmology really much relies on the existence of an adiabatic degree of freedom that we call the curvature perturbation. Whether you use uh, effective field theory construction or not, it's a matter of fact. When you look at uh, cosmic microwave background data, the like entropic or isocurvature mode is only uh, at most one percent of the energy budget. So we know that inflation is very much described by an adiabatic direction. And then there is this question of how does this adiabatic direction emerges? And adiabatic di direction are really much related to the notion of hydrodynamical mode. And if there is the existence of such an hydrodynamical mode, it is likely that it is associated with a symmetry breaking pattern given our modern understanding of the emergence of this sort of hydrodynamical mode. So I think it seems to work well. I think you can argue from the existence of this adiabatic mode that it is likely there is such a symmetry breaking pattern that exists, maybe not necessarily in terms of that transition symmetry but there should be a sort of time, like uh, there should be a symmetry breaking pattern to explain the emergence of a hydrodynamic mode. Then I guess it's uh, yeah, then the question of uh, how miraculous it is. I guess it depends a bit to who you talk. To. I hope it answers a bit the, the question, but I agree with you. It's a fascinating. Uh, One more question that I want to ask. Uh, this is the usual. EFT uh, construction by Chum, et al. You are uh, Paolo Cremel. Yes, 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 sure, sure, definitely. Yeah, the so, historical construction yeah. of EFT. So I'm just asking that once you incorporate the dissipations, uh, will it going to be changed this uh, Wilsonian coefficient m2, m3, m1 bar, m2 bar? Okay, okay. So yeah, I'll come back to it uh, later on. Uh, but let me comment briefly about it. So we will construct a theory that in a certain limit recover the usual EFT of inflation, but extend it with new operators. The thing that is a bit subtle is that some of the operators of this EFT will be mapped to several operators in the open effective field theory of inflation. And we will recover this construction only when we tune several EFT coefficient in the open EFT of inflation to a particular combination to recover the usual I, I, operators I, I of I the know. effective field theory of inflation. So you are right that there is no one-to-one -one mapping between the Wilsonian coefficient of this theory probably, and the Wilsonian probably coefficient. In, probably in your paper, you have actually mentioned uh, an advanced pi A and retarded pi R. Yes. And, uh, yes, yes, I will present them in a second. Yeah, and with some modifications and rearranging, uh, you can actually map that thing. Yes, yes. So I think uh, it's a work that we need to do as systematically as we can to tell, okay, if I have this operator in the EFT of inflation, it's equivalent in the open effective field theory of inflation is 
this set of operators. I think it's something that we need to do in a systematic manner. So we've tried to done it in our paper for the operators we had identified, but I don't think it is yet exhausting because yeah, let, let me come to this point and I will explain um, some work that remains to be done. Because what is important about this CFT of inflation is that it's hard to study as it is. Because at the moment, all the fluctuations are in the metric and it's not so convenient to, to study it. So the way people usually study it is by reintroducing the fluctuation of the scalar field by performing what we call the Stuckelberg trick, which is just a time diffeomorphism of a time reparametrization. When you do this reparametrization of time, the term that are for the covariant won't transform, such as the Ricci scalar, but the function of time will be expanded uh, because of the time reparametrization. And so does the other components, such as G00 or the extrinsic curvature, and so on. And this is the way you introduce this scalar field called pi. This pi field is called the Goldstone boson. And it will be quite convenient because there are two massive simplifications that occur during inflation. The first one is that if you work in the so-called thrower expansion, which is the regime of inflation where the background is nearly frozen and you have a nearly exponential expansion, then in that case, the mixing between this Goldstone boson and the fluctuation of the metric is very small. It's suppressed in the slow parameter. And the second aspect that is nice... Is, is yes. this your decoupling limit? Yes, it's the decoupling limit. And importantly, we will use this simplification in our paper to have a simple story. But as you can guess, it's not the end of the story because we now have to understand what happens if we relax this decoupling assumption and consider the mixing between the Goldstone boson and the fluctuation of the metric. This is something that we are currently working on, but that was not included in our already published paper. And so this is something that we need to do to complete this mapping of these operators to the one on the open effective field theory of inflation. And the second aspect that we need to account for is that in our paper, we also consider what we call the derivative expansion, which is this fact that the term that appears with the extrinsic curvature they are what we call higher order operators. So they come with more derivative acting on the fields. And it makes that they are further suppressed at, for instance, the end of inflation on superable scale compared to, for instance, the G00 operators. So in this derivative expansion, we can also truncate and work at lowest order in derivative. And in general, it means that we drop all the extrinsic curvature contribution. And in that case, the theory becomes very simple. It's the theory of a shift symmetric scalar in an expanding background. So no, we have to go beyond this assumption. But first, the question that we have considered is the following. In this approach, we write down an action for this Goldstone boson pi. It means that it is like a Hamiltonian evolution, which is a unitary evolution that is telling us that this Goldstone boson cannot lose information in its surrounding. So now the question is, how? what about we relax this assumption? How do we include dissipation and noise in this construction? And that was the second motivation for our work. So now I will explain uh, what for, we have done. For the yeah. unitary case, you always look for this Hamiltonian evolution. So for the dissipation and noise, probably then you have to consider the evolution of the density matrix. Uh, exactly, exactly. So... So the Liouvillian evolution, as you said before, like um, when you introduce dissipation and noise, the dynamical operator that generates the evolution is not anymore a Hamiltonian that is Hermitian, is a more complicated object that comes in what we call the master equation. It's sometimes called the Liouvillian, and it can be also expressed in terms of a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian that could also work. So we need a more complicated object. And uh, hopefully, yes, I will explain how it appears. So in this work, our goal was to construct this bottom-up open effective field theory for inflation. And we strongly relied on the past work by Lopez Nasir, Porto, Senatore, and Zaldariaga, where the authors considered dissipative effect in the AFT of inflation. The difference with our work is that we directly work at the level of the schwinger kendish or in-in path integral. That is, in a sense, we provide a path integral representation for this problem. And then the construction works as any other EFT. That is, we first identify the low energy degrees of freedom. 
we spell a set of physical principles and symmetries in order to write down the most generic functional. And then we identify uh, what we call a radiatively power, sorry, radiatively stable power counting scheme, which is just a way to make a truncation to keep only a finite number of operators so that we have something that is tractable. So let's follow these steps. First, the low energy degrees of freedom. We want to recover the usual AFT of inflation in a certain limit. So we will use the same degree of freedom, that is this nambu goldstone boson of spontaneous symmetry breaking of time transition symmetry. But now the goal is to describe it in this in-in path integral that I presented before. So it means that we will have two pi field, one for the plus branch and one for the minus branch. Or equivalently, there will be a very convenient uh, basis, which is just a rotation that we call the Keldish basis in terms of the retarded component, which is the mean between the plus and the minus, and the advanced component, which is the difference between the plus and the minus field. Okay, so these are our degree of freedom. Now the question is, what is the most generic generating functional I can write on? The generating functional is the object that we use to derive the observable. That is, if I take a functional derivative with respect to the sources, I will obtain, for instance, the expectation value for my power spectrum, or my best spectrum, and so on. And what we want to describe is both the unitary theory, which is along the two branches of the path integral, but also the non-unitary part, which contains dissipation and not. And then, how do we go one step further? We need to spell out physical principle and symmetries. So at the level of the physical principle, what we will use is a set of constraints that we call the non-equilibrium constraint. And that was developed in this series of paper. The idea is that we cannot write whatever we want in this inference functional if we want to describe a physical dynamics. For instance, if we require that our open EFT comes from the fact we do not observe all the degrees of freedom, but still there exists somewhere, even if I don't know it, what we call a UV completion. That is a description of the model that contains all the degrees of freedom of the universe. I don't know what is this UV completion, but let's assume it exists. If it exists and it is unitary, then it means that there is a quantum state in this theory that I don't know, which is trace normalized, Hermitian, and positive. These are the requirements for having a well-defined quantum state. And what the authors have realized is that asking for the existence of this state, even if I don't know what it is, implies a set of constraints on your inference function because you cannot write whatever you want. So this is the object that controls both the unitary and the non-unitary part. And what the authors have realized is that if you ask for the existence of a normalized state, then it means that this effective action must start at least linear in the advanced field. And that is already very useful because you have restricted the shape of what you need to write on. The second aspect is that if you ask for the existence of an emission state, it will imply that the odd powers of the advanced field will be always real, whereas the even powers will be always imaginary. So that will be another constraint on what you can write on. So and the last thing is, yes? Here you have written imaginary part of S effective is greater than or equal to zero. So yes. uh, is it basically coming from this optical theorem or something like that? Um, that's a good question. In a sense, yes, because the optical theorem is also a positivity constraint. That yeah. is, it's also some requirements to guarantee that the statistic you obtain is the is a physical statistics. And in particular, the eigenvalue of uh, um, like the positivity eigenvalue of a density operator must be mapped to positive eigenvalues. And in a sense, there is a connection. Uh, this is why I argue that this requirement can be thought as a sort of positivity bond on the noise coefficient of our theory. Yet, how to make it more precise than this, I don't know. So I can, I can remember, but, maybe you can look into that. Uh, there is a paper written by Daniel Bowman. Uh, he actually yes. had written, uh, what is the optical theorem for cosmology? 
from this perspective of bootstrap and all. Uh, I yes, yes. He had written this paper with a guy, I, I forgot the name, but this paper was written, I think, in 2015-16. Uh, yes, yes. In Cambridge, we also have a lot of people that has developed the optical, the, what they call the cosmological optical theorem. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So maybe you can look into that. It, it would be... Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, we didn't have time to do it yet, but indeed you can already feel that there are some connection with the usual techniques that people use. It's just that no, we need to spend time to make this mapping explicit, that we haven't done it yet. But just to explain where this bond comes from, if you want, it comes also simply from the, the requirement of convergence of this path integral. Because if you want this path integral to converge, then you, you need to have this constraint. Otherwise, you, you'll see explicitly that it will take. But yeah, that would be interesting to make this contact that we haven't done yet. So these requirements they are already useful for us because they restrict the shape of the inference functional we can write down. But then we need to go one step further and we need some input to capture the physics of inflation. And as we said before, in the idea of the effective theory of inflation, what captures correctly the physics of inflation is the spontaneous symmetry breaking of time transition symmetry. So we need to understand how works symmetries in this problem. And for this, we are based our understanding in two papers that develop the so-called Enin coset construction. It's a complicated term to explain the symmetry breaking pattern in this kind of Schringer create dish approach. The idea is that when we have a unitary theory, we have two copies in the two branches of the path integral. It means in particular that we have two copies of the symmetry breaking pattern. And since we have two copies, we have two Goldstone bosons, pi plus and pi minus. Both of them transform non-linearly under time translation symmetry, which is the explicit example showing that they are Goldstone bosons. But now the subtlety is the fact that we are introducing mixing between the two branches of the path integral because of the dissipative and non-unitary effect. And the consequence is that we do not anymore have two independent symmetry breaking pattern. What people say is that we transform a strong symmetry breaking pattern to a weak symmetry breaking pattern, and that we are further breaking the symmetry group to a smaller subgroup, which is a diagonal subgroup. So the long story short, what it is meaning is that instead of having two Goldstone bosons, in the end, we only have one of them, the retarded component, whereas the advanced component will transform just as regular matter. That is, introducing dissipation and noise reduces the number of Goldstone bosons from two to one. This is what is happening. It's useful to understand this because it means that now we have our building blocks. If we work in this uh, decoupling limit at lower order in derivative, it means that we can consider the theory constructing out of the shift symmetric retarded field and just the usual matter field for the advanced component. So we have at our, our building blocks. The last thing we need is a way to only keep a finite number of operators. And for this last step, we have assumed locality. It's a very strong assumption because in general, when we take a model and integrate out some AV degree of freedom, it can lead to some form of non-locality. Yet we would like to argue that it's not a problem that is only specific to open approaches. It's a problem that is specific to any effective theory we try to construct for cosmology. That is very often, it's hard to construct an EFT if you give up on locality. And if you are considering situation where non-locality is very likely to play a role, then it's probably better to use model building than to use effective field theories. So that's our point for locality. But for the moment, let's consider it all. And we combine these ingredients together. That is, we have the non-equilibrium constraint, the symmetry breaking pattern, and locality. And under these assumptions, working is decoupling the limit with... Uh, so I, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. So when, sure. when you are considering this diagonal representation of the group, are you thinking that it's a reducible representation? Um, that's a good question. So I think in the case we consider, yes, because the symmetry breaking pattern is relatively simple. We just consider time transition symmetry. So it's a sort of um, fancy U1 symmetry. 
So you cannot go below this. There is only one generator if you want. But no, there is this question that remains open if you consider a bigger symmetric group. And I think in this paper, they discuss uh, some SU2 symmetry breaking pattern, in which case uh, it might be even richer. Like, uh, as you mentioned, you can have a substructure that appear in this thing. We haven't considered this case uh, for the moment. But it's uh, like it's a very rich uh, field. And I would very much encourage people to go into this direction if they are interested in symmetries, because the understanding of symmetries in this kind of finger Kaldish formalism is, in my opinion, still uh, at its youth. And I don't think we have everything under control yet. So if people want to do more work on this direction, I think it's also a promising uh, so there, is, there is another question by uh, sure. one of the students, uh, sure. Ahashkar, uh, he asked, could you please explain again the part of the strong and weak symmetry breaking from fluctuations and dissipations? Yes, yes. Um, okay. Um, so it's a terminology that is used in this context of open quantum systems to describe um, uh, different ways symmetry breaking pattern can happen in open quantum system. And um, so I'm not a complete expert on this, but from what I understood, when you have the strong symmetry, it means that your symmetry applies in the two branches of this single, of this Schwinger Keldish contour. So it's like the usual situation of the usual EFT of inflation. You have the symmetries that apply in each branch of the path integral, and this is why you have two Goldstone bosons, one for each branch of the path integral. Whereas when you include this dissipation and noise, you go from this strong symmetry breaking pattern to this weak symmetry breaking pattern, where if you want, the dynamical object is not anymore the Hamiltonian, it's this Liouvillian. So this, there is only one symmetry breaking pattern, one for the two branches of the path integral. And this is why, in this case, we only have the retarded component that is the Goldstone boson. The advanced one is not anymore. And this is the difference, from what I understood, between weak and strong. But uh, it might be a bit more subtle than this. And um, I'm sorry if I'm not super clear on this question, because I don't think I have myself the best understanding of this question. So I hope at least that this simple idea that when you are unitary, you don't mix the two branches of the path integral, so you have two copies, whereas where you include dissipation and noise, you include mixing, so you cannot anymore have two copies, you break to something smaller, which is this diagonal subgroup. I hope this idea at least is clear and well under control. So I hope it answers the question. Yes, yes. And we can come back to it later on if needed. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so under this assumption, we obtain this construction. We call the open effective field theory of inflation. And um, the idea is the following. It's a construction that in a certain limit recovers the usual AFT of inflation, but also allows us to extend it to include more effects that are dissipation and noise. For instance, let's consider the quadratic effective function. The usual EFT of inflation has one free parameter, which is the speed of sound. In our case, we have five free parameters, the usual speed of sound, but also a dissipation parameter that will control the exchange of energy between the Goldstone boson and its surrounding. And we have three noise directions that correspond to the fluctuation of the surrounding path, whatever it is, leaving imprint onto the Goldstone boson. So the same also also at the cubic order. The usual EFT of inflation, you have one new free parameter. In our case, we have a bunch of them, 13 new parameters. But the important aspect about it is that the EFT of inflation is known for relating operators at different order because of the symmetry pattern, like the, what we call non-linearly realized boost. This is why in the EFT of inflation, when you have a small speed of sound, you have large non-Gaussianities in the equilateral shape. 
Here, the same holds true, not only for the unitary direction, but also for the non-unitary effects, such as the dissipation and the noise. And in fact, it was a point already pointed out in this paper by Lopez Nassian collaborator. So the take home message is that we have a theory that we can write on systematically that in a certain limit recovers the EFT of inflation, but also in extend it to describe local dissipative models of inflation. So that's it for the construction part. Now, in the time remaining, we will discuss a bit the phenomenological aspects, like uh, what do we expect in terms of signature for this class of models. But first, any question about the construction? Okay, I think we could. Hello. Yes, yes, sure. I have another question actually. So, sure. if uh, if we consider just a like a particle in a thermal bath, right? So it executes yes. Brownian motion, and there also you can incorporate such kind of dissipation and fluctuation effects, and you can construct a similar kind of formalism that you have like displayed here, but it's in a UV scenario. So. Like I'm asking, my main question is that can you reduce to such a formalism from this UV action that you have presented here for a particle in the yeah. ground? Yes, I think so. Uh, if I understand correctly. Yeah. So so far we there is another level of constraint that we haven't imposed, that we are that are called the fluctuation dissipation relation, or in the modern language, the KMS symmetry. And these fluctuation dissipation relations are telling you that your Goldstone boson is coupled so, to a bath that is a thermal bath. Actually, actually, uh, I did it later. You also did it. So both of us actually written uh, on the quantum field theory generalization of Caldera legate. Yes, scalar, yes, yes. Two scalar fields coupled with each other. And you want to integrate one of the scalar fields, which which is heavy, uh, corresponding to the UV degrees of freedom, and you want to write down an IR effective field theory. Uh, is this the same thing, Ahaskar? You are pointing. Yeah, it's it was along these lines because the kind because the UV formalism that you are showing here is just the same doubt that we can actually reduce, like taking some kind of a semi-classical limit and reduce to an action for that kind of a scenario of a particle in a thermal bath. Like, can we do that with the action that you have presented? Okay, so yes, yes, I, I think we can do it. So let me answer the question in two ways. Uh, First, okay. I will give an explicit example of matching. That is an explicit example when we write on a model, we write on the EFT and show that the two are equivalent. So it's an explicit example that uh, our EFT can describe uh, this kind of situation where we start with a microphysical model with a thermal bath for the environment and the system, integrate out the environment and uh, obtain the EFT for the system that will be described in terms of this language. So that's doable. The only thing I would like to stress is the formalism we write on here is somehow bigger than what the situation you described in the sense that we haven't imposed that the environment reaches thermal equilibrium. Because very often when you do a computation in cosmology, an explicit computation, you will realize that your environment is not at equilibrium because of the expansion of the background. So it means that in cosmology, it's not guaranteed that this coefficient that appear here will obey this kind of fluctuation dissipation relation. And this is why we wanted to relax this assumption in the first place. But if you are confident enough, for instance, if your environment is, let's say, a photon bath, then you can add this other layer of assumption and it will even further simplify the CFT. So for instance, you will have only uh, two EFT parameters in that case. And I think it can be a promising direction, for instance, to make contact with warm inflation and to make contact also with more suitable data analysis with less parameters. So yeah, I, but please come back to me at the end if uh, the matching uh, does not answer this connection between an explicit model and the EFT will write on. Yeah, okay, thank you. Phenomenology is just as any quantum field theory in first place. That is, we first saw the quadratic dynamics, the free theory, from which we get the propagators and the two-point function, which is the power spectrum. 
then we use this input to treat perturbatively the interaction, just as we do in some QFT. So let's talk first about the free theory. The free theory is only the quadratic action, so it's a Gaussian path integral that I can perform analytically. You get some exact result. And in the case of this in in contour, the difference with usual particle physics where you only have the Feynman propagator is that here you have three propagators, two of which you are certainly very familiar with, which are the retarded greens and advanced greens function. And the third one might be less familiar, is known as the Keldish green function. And it's an object that encodes the level of the fluctuation in your system. When it's very high, it means that you have a lot of fluctuation in your system. When it's very small, it means that you have very small fluctuation in your system. So what I would like to show in this slide is the expression of these propagators for primordial cosmology for the sitter expansion, where H is the above parameter, K is the co-moving uh, wave number, eta is the conformal time, gamma is the dissipation parameter. These functions are uncle functions of the first kind. And here you also have uh, some nasty function that I haven't written because they depend on hypergeometric function. So my goal in showing you this expression is twofold. First is to show that we have exact results in the case of the sitter for the propagator. It means that for the power spectrum, we can have exact solution, which is interesting. But the drawback is that you can see that these expressions are quite complicated. And so when we will start to consider interaction, we will have to integrate over time a product of these propagators. And as you can see, it is very unlikely that you will find analytical results for the interaction because of the complicated form of this propagator. So that was my reason for showing you this expression. But now that you have the propagators, it means that you can obtain the power spectrum, which is a two-point function of the Goldstone boson that we can relate with the quantity that we really observe in the sky, which is the curvature perturbation power spectrum, which is constrained by the cosmic microwave background and large-scale structure of the universe. And my point is the following. Because of the symmetries we put in our problem, we are guaranteed that we will obtain a nearly scale invariant power spectrum, whatever we do. And in particular, so this is this expression in terms of the first noise parameter. You can expand it either at large or small dissipation. And you can fit to the data by imposing some scale hierarchies among the various parameters of the problem. But it also means that you cannot distinguish this class of model from other models such as usual EFT of inflation at the level of the power spectrum. Still, there is an interesting remark that we can do is that coming back to this question of the thermal equilibrium, if we impose that the bath that surround our Goldstone boson is a thermal equilibrium, it means that we have this fluctuation dissipation relation that impose a relationship between the noise and the dissipation that scales as a function of the temperature. And in that case, we recover at large dissipation that our power spectrum scales linearly with the temperature and as the square root of the dissipation power meter, which is in fact a well-known result of warm inflation. So I hope that this is the first hint toward this idea that in the limit of thermal equilibrium, we can use the EFT we wrote down to recover some of the results of warm inflation. And I think that future work should be to make this connection more explicit to try to see how much of warm inflation we can recover from this construction. Okay, you can consider other noise, but the end point story is that we also recover nearly scale invariant power spectrum, and so a priori we cannot distinguish the theory at this level. No, the, it means that if we want to find something specific about this approach, we need to go to higher order uh, correlators, such as what we call the bispectrum, which is the three-point function of this curvature perturbation. Because of the homogeneity symmetry, this bispectrum depends on configuration of uh, closed triangles in terms of the co-moving wave numbers. And so we will try to characterize this object that appears here. The way we compute it is just as a usual we have Tinker space time, that is, we derive the Feynman rules, which are the set of diagrammatic representation where plane lines represent insertion of the Keldish propagator, mixed lines represent insertion of the retarded green function. And whenever we have a vertex, we have to integrate from initial time to final time. 
And since in our work so far, we only consider contact by spectra, these are diagrams of this type that pretty much look something like this, where you have an integral from initial time to finite time in conformal time with three insertion of the propagators. You can eventually have uh, derivative operator that acts on it, but the structure will always be the same. And then you need to find a way to evaluate these integrals. So the way we will analyze the bispectrum is for the usual treatment. That is, we look at two objects. One is the so-called shape function. It allows to tell you which of this triangular configuration maximizes the signal. And the second quantity is the so-called FNL parameter, which is telling you the magnitude of the signal in a given configuration. So let's explore a bit what to expect for this quantity. But first, before I give the curve space-time result, since it will be hard, it's good to gain some intuition. And to gain some intuition, we use flat space result because in flat space, we can reach analytical result and we have uh, somehow good understanding of what's happening. So when we look at this bispectrum in flat space, insist, it looks always something like this, a polynomial of the kinematic variables, which are the energy shifted by the dissipation parameter, divided by an object that we call the singularity structure. And the singularity structure, it's this mathematic function, that describe physically either the zero to three or three to zero particle creation or annihilation, or what we call the one to two or two to one scattering mediated by the presence of the bath. And that is an object that captures a lot of physics and that raises the hope that eventually we can bootstrap this kind of bispectrum because we can understand it in terms of physical, like uh, creation or annihilation or scattering of particles. And when you study this function or this bispectrum in general, you observe that there are mostly two dynamical regimes. One, a very large dissipation, where the part that dominates is always this imaginary part here. And it makes that the signal will always speak in what we call the equilateral shape, where k1 is equal to k2 is equal to k3. That's the first regime. The second regime of interest is rather the opposite one, the one of small dissipation, where k1 is equal to k2 plus k3, or something like this. This is what we call a kinematic transfer, where one particle is scattering and giving momenta to two other, or the converse situation. And in that case, the bispectrum is speaking in a very different con configuration that we call the folded limit. So that was important for us to understand a bit the phenomenology of this singularity structure and this transition from large to small dissipation, from equilateral to folded. So if I zoom in a bit and look at what are the fingerprints of the signal, in this figure, you have, again in flat space, the evolution of this shape function when I vary the dissipation parameter, where orange is large dissipation, blue slightly smaller dissipation, and green even smaller dissipation. And what we observe is that at measure we reduce the dissipation parameter, we increase the signal in the folded configuration. Okay, so that's the most important aspect of the signal. The second very important aspect is that you can observe the signal never fully diverges. It is always finite for the whole range of kinematic variable. And the reason for the signal being finite is that in the previous slide, you can see that whenever the dissipation parameter is non-zero, it's impossible that this function vanishes. This is what we call the regularization of the divergence due to the dissipation. And it will turn out to be an important fact of this model in the context of cosmology, because it will be the main feature to distinguish it from other candidates that also boost the signal in defaulted singularities, such as well-known models, such as non bunch davis initial condition. And the last important part about this model is that since the divergence is regularized by the dissipation, it also means that in this part of the triangular configuration that we call the squeeze limit, the signal completely vanishes. And this is a sign of what we call the consistency relation. That is the fact, uh, if you want, it's the equivalent of a soft theorem, but for cosmology. 
And the reason why the consistency relation still holds in our situation is precisely because the divergence is regularized. So these are the main features of this signal. Now, we need to move from flat space to the sitter. And in general, this is very hard. So the reason why it is so hard is because the propagators are very complicated. So if you want to compute this bike spectrum, you won't be able to find, in general, an analytical result. So you need either to rely on numerics or to rely on some asymptotic expansion, such as the sub regime, to understand analytically what's going on. But from the combination of numerics and expansion, it seems that the main features we observe in flat space also applied in cosmology. The first thing is that when we work at large dissipation, where gamma is much smaller than the upper parameter, we have this orange curve, but the signal is really peaking in the equilateral shape. As when we work at small dissipation, it's just as in flat space, the signal peaks in the opposite regime in the folded configuration, yeah, in the negative value, but it's the folded configuration. Then the third remark is that it seems that in all cases, this consistency relation is still old. And that is important for us because it means that we can distinguish a priori this kind of model from non bungevis initial condition. For instance, by looking at things such as the linear bias in large scale structure survey, which is a good way to constrain non gaussianities in this squeeze limit. Okay, and the last thing is that again, it seems that the presence of the dissipation is making the integrals to be convergent over all the dynamical range. And this is something you can check in the sub regime where you will observe that your integrals are always convergent whenever the dissipation is non-zero. So that's the fingerprint, and that's what we expect about this model, with the most striking feature being the smoking gun at small dissipation in the folded configuration. Now, to detect something, you not only need to have uh, an interesting signature, you also need to have signal in it. And the thing that will tell you if you have signal in it is the so-called FNL parameter. If FNL is large, then you might have a chance to observe it in the near future. For instance, this is the value of FNL equilateral and the shaded region correspond to either the current constraint we have from the Planck satellite or very futuristic and maybe too optimistic constraint coming from very large scale structure surveys that are very futuristic. So we need a way to tell something about this FNL parameter. And I would like to stress that we have developed what we call a heuristic estimate, which is a simple way to give an expectation of what should be this FNL parameter for a given operator. And in order to understand this FNL parameter, we need to understand precisely what is the physics that generates the fluctuation. First, it's important to realize that we have still an adiabatic direction, that is this retarded component and that correspond to the curvature perturbation during inflation. So we can relate these two quantities. And just as always during inflation, this adiabatic direction freezes on large scale. But what is important is that the freezing time now depends on the value of the dissipation parameter. That is, at large, sorry, at small dissipation, the freezing time is pretty much the same as usual inflation, that is, it happened roughly around a bulk crossing. Whereas at very large dissipation, the freezing happened, in fact, much sooner on the sub regime at the time that is controlled by the square root of gamma over h. So that's the first observation, that the freezing time depends on dissipation. The second observation is the following. The most important reason of why do we have signal is not really the initial fluctuation because the presence of the dissipation is damping the initial signal. What is really generating the fluctuation is what we call the noise that is coming from the fluctuation of the surrounding environment. So it's a noise source dynamic. And the object that sources the noise is precisely the advanced component. Its role as being an auxiliary field is to encode the statistic of the noise. And the parameter that tells you how big is the noise is the beta one parameter. So it, this thing is important for us because it tells us that the most important quadratic term in the quadratic action is in fact the noise coefficient. And therefore, when we want to estimate non gaussianities we'll compare some cubic operators to this leading quadratic operator, which is the noise. And when we do so, we can obtain the heuristic estimate that compares very well to the numerical result. For instance, in this figure, 
These are numerical results from numerical integration of FNL in the equilateral shape as a function of the dissipation parameter for a few operators of our AFT. And this heuristic estimate is a way to understand why when we have special derivatives, we obtain FNL that grows linearly with the dissipation parameter, which is the blue curve, whereas when we have the temporal derivative, derivative with respect to conformal time, the signal rather plateaus at large dissipation, which is the orange curve. Or it was already observed in the past literature that there are some operators that seem to not depend strongly on the dissipation parameter, Oops, sorry, such as this one, and the heuristic estimate is also a way to explicitly see that. My point here is that you've seen that in the CFT, we have a lot of EFT coefficient. And you need to be able to tell if it's relevant a priori or not to consider some operator. So if you decide to work in a sort of uh, analysis of this class of model, I would strongly recommend to use this heuristic estimate to have an a priori on what are the most relevant operators to consider if you want to find large uh, non-Gaussian signal. So the last thing I would like to say, because probably we should stop there after, is that here in this figure, you can see that the values of the FNL parameters are very large, surprisingly large, in fact. And the reason why they are surprisingly large is that this value of the EFT coefficient comes from a matching with a specific model. It's a model that was proposed a few year, uh, one year ago by Paolo Criminelli and collaborators, which is an explicit model that it can be described by our EFT. It's a model where the inflaton field is coupled to a massive scalar field that has a gauge symmetry, which is a softly broken U1 gauge symmetry. And what is important with its model is that it's a model that exhibits what we call an instability band, but this instability band is very narrow. It happens in the subbubble regime so that you have a lot of particle production in the subbubble regime. And then the interplay between the inflaton field and this gauge field will be generating dissipation and noise we later on observe in our EFT. So this model is a sort of toy model to describe this very wide class of models useful for inflation that are called gauge inflation model. And in this category of gauge inflation model, very often you have particle production that leads to dissipation and noise in the inflaton sector. So the authors have realized that they can describe their problem in terms of what we call a nonlinear Langevin equation, which I've written here. It's a stochastic differential equation that contains a probabilistic part some cubic operators and some noise. And this noise in particular are some non-Gaussian statistics. And what we have shown in our paper is that this nonlinear Langevin equation can be explicitly mapped to our EFT through this uh, Hubbard Stratanovich trick. In particular, for instance, what we observe is that the first line I already presented it, it's a Gaussian action where we have the speed of sound, the linear dissipation, which is here, the quadratic noise, then these two operators correspond to the nonlinear realization of the dissipation. This operator corresponds to the mixing of the EFT operator with the noise. And this last operator corresponds to the non-Gaussian statistics of the noise. So that's an ex explicit example of realization for our EFT. It seems to point toward the idea that this EFT are useful to describe this kind of gauge inflation model that can be described as local dissipative model of inflection. And the last thing is that in this kind of approaches, because of the particle production, some of the EFT parameters can become very large in a very short time scale. And this is why some EFT parameters being large leads to large non-Gaussian signal. So I hope it's a somehow interesting illustration to see pretty much the range of model of interest that we are looking for with this kind of EFT. So let me conclude. In this presentation, I showed you an explicit construction for bottom-up EFT of inflation that is based on past work by Lopez Nasir, Porto, Senator, and Zaldaraga. In our case, we updated this construction to have a path integral representation. We also assume locality and we obtain an EFT that is relatively easy to write on and that we can study systematically in perturbation theory. This theory has some smoking gun signal, which is this folded configuration at low dissipation that 
can allow us to distinguish it from other inflationary classes of models. And our hope is that this formalism can be used as a sort of starting point to have a sort of systematic study of dissipative and diffusive effect during primordial cosmology. And now we have a lot of work to pass this thing further. So on the theory side, what we are actively working on at the moment is to go beyond the decoupling limit, that is to consider the mixing between the scalar degree of freedom and the tensor modes, or the fluctuation of the metric in general. And that would be a way to describe, for instance, the propagation of gravitational waves or dark energy. But there are many other works that can be done on the theoretical side, for instance, foster the correction with warm inflation, foster the correction with stochastic inflation, as we mentioned before, maybe have a better understanding on the symmetries in this in, in schwinger keldish approach. So there is room for theoretical development, and I strongly encourage anyone that would like to join this journey to, to jump in, and I'd be happy to chat. On the observational side, if you are skilled with data analysis, it would be very interesting to understand if we can put some constraint on some of the EFT parameters, for instance, at least the dissipative operator that are appearing in this construction. And hopefully that will allow us to better understand uh, how do we, uh, how close or how far are we to constrain these classes of models from either CMB or large scale structure data analysis. And so my hope is that by extending the range of effective field theory we are using for pre-model cosmology, we are finding new ways to understand why it is so hard to import some techniques uh, of particle physics in cosmology, such as positivity bonds, and hopefully find ways to overcome these difficulties. So in this world, I thank you for your attention, and please, if you have questions, uh, we can go on. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Thomas, for giving such a nice and interesting overview of open EFT approaches of inflation. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please discuss. And if you don't have any question comments, you can write to Thomas. I think I, yes, have, uh, I have asked many questions, uh, but if you have specifically, Thomas, please uh, share the slides with me sometime. Okay, okay, sure. I will send you that, especially given that um, I, I thought it was more interesting to discuss points and take time. So I... I completely skip the second part of my talk. Yeah, but uh, which share, is... share it, share it, uh, because that might... Yeah, yeah, I'll send you the slide and we can discuss later on. And please, for all the master and PhD students, if you have a question, do not hesitate to reach me by email. Uh, I'd be happy to chat. And um, yes, so the other part of my talk that I won't have time to present is related more on quantum information aspects and it's, uh, if it's a topic that also interests you we can talk uh, another time in the future so that's possible i will ask you to give another talk <laughs> <laughs> perfect sounds like a good plan okay uh, yes so yeah um, i hope it was a hope, good overview you, of this hope, hope you have enjoyed because i actually ask a lot of questions hope you don't mind with that no, no, that was very useful. In fact, uh, I think there were very good comments and it's always interesting to see. Um, I think it's this kind of question that allows us to realize what are the things that still needs to be achieved and what are the future works that needs to be done. And in fact, there are a lot of them. Like, um, in my opinion, these things are still quite uh, juvenile and we need to really strengthen them. So I think there is a lot of room for work and this is why it's good to have question and feedback on this. So thank you for the, the question. It was very interesting. So uh, maybe, maybe I should stop sharing the screen yeah. for a second. So I'm uh, requesting Ahaskar and Kritard Gulam, everybody give us short clap for uh, Thomas for giving such a nice talk. Uh, yeah. So Thomas, thank you everyone. thanks again and yeah. see you soon thank you with your another part. yes see you around yes definitely let's keep in touch and thank you everyone for having attended the talk and listened to this presentation thank you see you bye guys bye thanks <laughs>